Hyatt's Dwyer. RichardDwyer.co. Keeping it free. Blogspot.com. Let's talk about a possible alternative history. Right? This is a video where we're just going to speculate about a case in which two people have already been convicted of murder. One of them admits that she pulled the trigger. Both of them are serving their terms in prison right now. Right? You may have seen or heard about the case of Joan Shannon and Elizabeth Shannon, right? And the murder victim, Joan's husband and Elizabeth's stepfather, David Shannon, right? You may have seen videos on ID Network and other networks. This case featured on shows like Snapped, right? Well, let's just speculate here. I'm not going to make factual assertions. I'm just going to speculate about a possible alternative history to this case. Understand, people have been convicted. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion or speculation from a complete stranger online. Now, a guy's at a party. Two teenage girls, Elizabeth Shannon and her friend Vera, are talking about a murder that Elizabeth Shannon committed. A partygoer contacts the police. The murder was in the news. Right? He tells police, hey, I was at this party. I think I might know who killed David Shannon. So, of course, the police track down Vera. Vera tells them that she was at the house the night David Shannon was murdered in his bed, sleeping next to his wife, Joan Shannon. Right? Vera claims that her good friend, Elizabeth Shannon, Joan's daughter, 15 at the time, had been given a gun by Joan Shannon, who urged 15-year-old Elizabeth Shannon to kill her stepfather. Right? Understand, David Shannon was not Elizabeth Shannon's birth father, right? David Shannon met up with Joan. Joan had two daughters, Daisy, two years older than Elizabeth, and Elizabeth Shannon, and David, an army major, ends up adopting Joan's kids, right? Joan and he get married. So, the household is dysfunctional, right? Daisy, as a teenager, ends up pregnant, right? She's no longer at the house. You have Elizabeth, who's now 15, at the house, right? Apparently, Elizabeth was someone who got into conflicts with her parents, Right? She had disagreements, we'll call them, politely, with her father, again, an army major, and with her mother, Joan Shannon. This was a dysfunctional family. Make no mistake about it. It's a dysfunctional family. Let's go one step further. The army major, David Shannon and his wife, Joan, were swingers. Let's also be as blunt as possible because it matters. Right? This happened in 2002. We weren't as 
racially enlightened back then as we are now, right? The United States had never had a person of color as president back in 2002, right? Just to understand, racial attitudes are slowly evolving. The primary guy who Joan Shannon would hang out with at swinger parties had dark skin. He was African American, a guy named Jeffrey Wilson. Right? He called himself the black stunt man. In other words, if a woman's partner wasn't getting the job done in certain areas, just like a stunt man for the heavy lifting in movies will swap in for the star for certain scenes, right? Jeffrey Wilson would swap in, this was his swinger persona, right, for the guy, uh, for liaisons with the guy's girlfriend slash wife, etc. So understand, Joan takes a liking to Jeffrey, starts taking him home, where her teenage daughter sees mommy and her black swinging partner hanging out at the house while dad is busy at work. But understand the situation here. Dad's the one who introduced the black stunt man to his wife. Right? Dad was there during some of the intimate times between Jeffrey Wilson and his wife. Right? Dad told Joan Shannon, and America is a free country. Understand that. Dad told his wife, look, you can hang out with this guy privately. I don't have to be around. So, while we could stand here and question the parenting as non-traditional, right? Just understand that Joan being with her swinger lover wasn't that big a deal when the daughter catches the two of them. In other words, Joan had an arrangement, an open marriage with her husband, right? So let's get back to police questioning. Now keep in mind, a guy sees Vera talking with Elizabeth Shannon, their teenagers at a party about a murder that Elizabeth committed. The cops talk with Vera Vera admits she was at the house that night, but when the murder took place, she was outside the house. In other words, you get the feeling that the murder took some planning, right? You got the feeling that Vera has a heads up to leave the house when the murder takes place. And Vera knows the shooter isn't Joan Shannon, the mother. The shooter is Elizabeth, excuse me, the shooter is her friend Elizabeth Shannon, who has been having problems with the parents. Well, the police track down Elizabeth Shannon. And Elizabeth Shannon, of course, goes into detail during her talk with police. After the police advise her of her right to an attorney, Right? She's only 15. She doesn't understand that there are things called public defenders. She feels, okay, I'm 15, but I can't afford an attorney. So I have to talk with the police. In other words, there's a big question in this case about whether this teenager understood that she didn't have to talk with the police. Well, of course, she has a story. And the story is that her mother 
groomed her to shoot her stepfather. That the mother gives her the gun and then starts telling her, look, here's what I want you to do with the gun. I want you to kill your father. Right? The prosecution, of course, then thinks about the case, realizes that the story of Joan Shannon being in bed with her husband seems to be contradicted by blood spatter. Right? He shot blood flies, stains the sheets. Joan has no blood on her. Right? No blood on her. Then, of course, the police find out about the swinging tapes. Right? David Shannon, the victim, has videos of he and his wife's activities with folks like the Black Stuntman, who they track down, and Jeffrey Wilson, who, of course, has an ironclad alibi, he was someplace else when the murder took place, admits to police that Joan was pressuring him for more of an emotional relationship, that she openly talked to him about wanting more, wanting to see him more, wanting to be with him more. And you can imagine, this was salacious, right, in North Carolina, where this case took place, the Fort Bragg area, right? White woman, black man, the black man is telling the cops that yes, he was involved with this married woman with her husband's consent, and yes, this white married woman was telling him she wanted to see more of him and things like that. He goes further and says, hey, I played along with her because I wanted her to pay for a motorcycle I was interested in. Right? Well, what I want people to do is to freeze for a moment. Understand, a jury convicts Joan Shannon based in part on the testimony of 15-year-old Elizabeth Shannon, who cuts a deal with authorities where she has to spend about 31 years in prison. In other words, this isn't a flippant deal. It's a heavy commitment. She has to spend about 31 years in prison. And of course, at trial, she testifies that, yes, I pulled the trigger. My mother gave me the gun, told me what to do. I followed instructions because I was an attention-starved teenager. And my mother was promising me that we would be more mother-daughter if I was able to do this crime. And of course, as a military man, let's be clear here. You know, if you're the prosecution and you're looking for a motive, as a military man, David Shannon had about $700,000 worth of life insurance and other benefits. So, of course, the prosecution argued that that was the motivation in this case, that Joan Shannon wanted the money and that she wanted to start a new life with her black swinger lover. Right? What I want folks to do here, especially those who have teenagers who are currently part of dysfunctional families or who were when they were younger, parts of dysfunctional families, where the team and the parents aren't on the same page, where there are arguments, the arguments are ongoing, right? The team doesn't really want to follow you know, the instruction of the parents. The teen is a rebel, right? And of course, the parents, while they might have their quirks, right? In this case, it's being swingers, 
The parents actually have a moral code that they want people to follow by. Right now, understand, in a setting like that, and we're just offering an alternative history here, right? This is speculation. It's nothing more. I'm not making statements of fact, but I am troubled deeply by this case, right? Deeply by this case. Is it possible? That 15-year-old Elizabeth was tired of her father being a bit of a disciplinarian, didn't get along with him, had had enough. In fact, her father, in her eyes, wasn't even her birth father. Right? Is it possible she blames the father, in part, because he's a military man and the family is moving? every few years, based on dad's military position, right? He has a position in the Special Forces Department of the U.S. military. Is it possible that the daughter just blames dad for a lot, that things deteriorate between daughter and father? Now, if you're the other parent, right? In a blended family like this, the daughter is your biological daughter. The older daughter's already left the home, right? Got pregnant, has left the home. What do you do if things between your biological daughter and your man, who you married, who you love, become unhinged, unhinged, to the point where they're arguing all the time. Is it possible, and this would not be the first family in which I've heard of this happening, is it possible that Joan Shannon just looked the other way? In other words, her army major husband, David, is at odds with the daughter. Who's acting out? By the way, Elizabeth Shannon in prison has acted out according to the write-up on this case on Oxygen.com. And she's been cited several times while in prison for theft and other transgressions, right? Think it through. So just imagine you're Joan Shannon. Let's just be hypothetical here, right? You're a swinger, that's really irrelevant. You love your husband. You've been married to him for years, right? He adopts Elizabeth when she's four years old. Understand, she's now 15 years old. The couple, Joan and David, have been together for more than a decade. Right? More than a decade. There's no indication in this case that David was violent, um, etc. toward Joan. So let's say that she's in bed. She knows that her daughter and her husband don't get along. But this has been going on for years, right? The family's dysfunctional. This isn't the first dysfunctional family in America. So she's in bed. She's figuring, hey, people will grow out of this. Elizabeth is 15. In three years, she's going to be 18. She'll be out of here. Um, you know, this scene isn't a violent scene. Uh, no one has to step in. It's really more a parental control and um, rebellious teen situation. So you're lying in bed next to your husband. You've given your daughter a gun because guess what, folks? People have the right to bear arms in the, in the United States, right? She may have given her daughter a gun so her daughter could defend herself, stay safe at school, 
right? Understand, many parents might think they have a rebellious teen, but might not think that if they give the teen a gun, that teen is going to use the gun to shoot parents. So let's say Elizabeth has a gun. Just food for thought. She has a gun. Let's say that night, and again, this is just alternative history. This isn't what the jury found. But let's say that night, Joan is asleep. Her husband's asleep. They're deep asleep. Suddenly, Joan hears gunshots. Let's say she looks up and she sees it's her daughter shooting her husband. Let's say the chickens come home to roost and she understands, my God, their dysfunctional relationship is even worse than I thought. Let's say the daughter actually prepared for this, right? The daughter's out practicing shooting the day before with her friend Vera, right? Think about that. The daughter's out with Vera the day before practicing shooting at some remote location. Let's say the daughter has had enough of the father and the daughter is just going to whack the father and thinks the mother's not going to care because the mother is fooling around with some other swinger. Well, if you're Joan Shannon and you wake up and let's say it all happens quickly, there's a shooting. Maybe when you wake up, you realize it's your daughter. Maybe by the time you open your eyes and you aren't shot, you think it might be your daughter, but you're not 100% certain. Well, that would explain her vague statements to the cops. The cops that night are talking to Joan Shannon, and Joan Shannon's unable to give much of a description of the height or weight of the shooter. Right? They're in the bedroom when David Shannon gets killed. The shooter just enters the bedroom fires the gun, turns and leaves. Police, being astute, notice too that Joan told them she leaves the house to call police. Right? The idea is who would do that if they knew a stranger was in the house with their child? Now, is it possible and let's be clear here. To find guilt, you have to do so beyond a reasonable doubt. If there's any reasonable explanation that conforms to the facts of the case, then some jurors should have thought, you know what? If there are equally viable explanations, how can I find beyond a reasonable doubt? that this person is guilty. Is it possible that Joan Shannon suspected that her daughter did the crime? Joan may have figured out that the gun she gave her daughter, who knows, maybe her daughter even asked for the gun, may have been a mind-blowingly bad decision. Would Joan Shannon be the first person to suspect that their teenager did a crime and then tried to cover it up in talking with police? Understand, you can love your husband, but unfortunately, he's already gone. He's already been murdered. Aren't there some people among us? In fact, I would say, Aren't there at least 20% of the people among us who if, they're thought, if they thought their teenager who was rebellious, who was troubled, 
killed someone, wouldn't try to protect that teenager. Folks, I'm just telling you, Oxygen Network and ID Network are flooded with cases where parents are trying to protect family members from criminal convictions, even though they loved the victim. Well, let's go one step further too. We know, without a doubt, that Elizabeth's friend, Vera, was with her when she was practicing shooting the day before the murders. We know that Elizabeth's friend, Vera, knew that she had, Elizabeth had killed her father because the two of them were discussing it at a party. Because Vera herself told police she was outside of the house when Elizabeth killed her father. Right, folks? Given that Vera knew at some point, at least after the murder, that Elizabeth Shannon was the shooter who killed her father, is it possible that these close friends discussed the murder and discussed what would be said to the cops if the cops arrested Elizabeth Shannon, right? Understand, this case is salacious. You can imagine how it played out at trial. My point to you is there is no third party eyewitness testimony, none of anyone being present at any time that Joan Shannon instructed her daughter to kill her husband and her daughter's stepfather. Right, folks? There's no such witness. The prosecution is relying on Elizabeth Shannon's statements as to what was said. Now understand how ridiculous the case is. If Joan Shannon is that careful in grooming Elizabeth, how is it that the murder plot could be so out in the open that Elizabeth is with her friend Vera the day before? She's with Vera while she's practicing her shooting. Right? If Joan Shannon groomed her daughter to kill her husband, how is it that these two teenage girls are at a party with third parties, one who calls the police, talking about the murder? Right, folks, alternative history here, just speculation from someone online, a stranger online. I'm just not sure if there's any proof, any credible proof that Joan Shannon knew this murder was going to take place before it did. I don't, you know, Again, Elizabeth Shannon in prison has been cited for misconduct several times. This is a rebellious team who may not have liked her stepfather. Right? This is a murder in the family that may have caught other family members by surprise. The evidence is just not there, in my opinion. 
certainly not beyond a reasonable doubt that Joan Shannon groomed her daughter to kill her husband. Understand too, Joan Shannon's black lover told police, he told Joan Shannon, hey, you and I are not going to be a couple. Right? Yes, he wanted a motorcycle. I'm sure he was vague and ambiguous. But understand, he was not the only man that Joan had swung with. Right? This case strikes me as a case where a jury finds out that a white woman who's married has been living a double life. Right? Forget the fact that it's actually a double life with her husband. With his consent. Right? The jury finds out that she's been living a double life. That her lover's a black guy. That her daughter kills her husband. And the jury then decides, you know what? This swinger wife must have been involved in the murder. Right? Must have been involved in the murder. Understand, Vera's not present when Joan Shannon is alleged to have groomed the daughter. Also, let's be clear here. If you have a rebellious teenager who's not following directions, is that the person you're going to ask to kill your husband? Also, I'm a bit bewildered here. You have a rebellious teenager who doesn't want to listen to her parents. The prosecution wants you to believe that based on her mother then acting in more of a loving way, that teenager is so attention starved that the teenager is prepared to kill. Think about that. Kill her stepfather. Also, this plot is so loose that the night of the killing, the mother allows the teenager to have her good friend Vera over. Does that make sense to you? Isn't the swinger part, the black guy part, of this case really irrelevant? Doesn't this case come down to the word of Joan Shannon versus the word of 15-year-old Elizabeth Shannon. Why would anyone believe Elizabeth Shannon over Joan? Especially given the lack of evidence and the sloppiness in which the crimes committed. Right? You mean to tell me a friend is with Elizabeth the day before the shooting as she practices shooting a gun? You mean to tell me that I'm the mother and I want my child to kill my husband and my child doesn't even know how to use a gun? You're telling me the night of the murder, my 15-year-old has a teenage friend over? You mean to tell me after the murder, I have no concerns when my 15-year-old is out at public parties with the very teenager who was over the house that night? Folks, it doesn't make sense unless you bring in extraneous facts like, oh, this married couple, the dead guy and his wife who lived are swingers. Oh, they're swinging interracially. Let's show the jury some of the private films they had. 
right? Oh, she was peered off at times with this black guy who she talked about meeting up with more. Right, folks, that stuff's not evidence. What is evidence? Is the absence of any reliable evidence that Joan Shannon knew this murder was going to take place before it did. And that the murder took place pursuant to her supervision and instruction. Understand, just because someone comes forward and gives a story to police or gives a story to a jury doesn't mean the jury has to accept that story as true. There simply isn't enough verification, in my opinion, to Elizabeth Shannon's story for any jury to accept it at face value. Right? She killed her father. Her mother may have tried to protect her in her statements to the police. Right? Nobody saw Joan Shannon coaching Elizabeth Shannon on how to commit the murder. The fact that Elizabeth Shannon has to practice using a gun and has a third party friend around makes that scenario even less likely. Understand too, when people point to the death benefits of a service member as the reason for a motive for a crime, you could do that anytime, anytime, any military member gets killed, right? There simply is a paucity of evidence here, a paucity of evidence of Joan Shannon openly planning on getting the death benefits. She certainly doesn't have that conversation with the black stuntman. So, it seems to me with little evidence, somehow the prosecution in this case, and again, this is just speculation by me, Right? Maybe the jury got it right. I have questions. Right? It's possible that with the paucity of evidence, the prosecution was able to fill in the gaps with saucy stories of swinging and interracial sex. That's how it seems to me. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.